Kind thanks go to Brilliant for sponsoring today's episode. How exactly does Mechazilla work? How do chopsticks catch rockets? Were there any problems with the Starship 20 static fire? What are three Taikonauts doing in a heavenly palace and why is it important? And who the heck came up with all these crazy names at SpaceX's Starbase? Let's find out. What about it? Go for launch. We're go for launch. Let's light this candle. Ignition sequence start. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? And as always, there's been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates First, I was sick with the flu and then I was gone on a trip to the island of Mallorca and it feels overwhelming to see what's happened in just 14 days since the last episode. SpaceX is racing down the milestone road and we're along for the ride. And the highlight for Starship and Starbase in the last week definitely was the progress on Mechazilla, SpaceX's Starship and Super Heavy Catcher. These pictures were taken by Starship Gazer, one of the most active contributors at Starbase and for the spaceflight community. Links to his Twitter and YouTube channel can be found in the description, go check him out. And what you're looking at here is the assembly stand used by SpaceX workers to put together three main parts that have been worked on for a while now. Two chopsticks and one carriage sled. And all three together are what's going to be the main catch mechanism for Starships and Super Heavy boosters down the line. First, SpaceX workers positioned the carriage frame onto the assembly stand and then, on October 10th, they lifted one of two chopsticks into place. Most of the names, like Chopsticks or Mechazilla, come from Elon Musk himself. So they have the Meme Lord's touch and sound a bit funny. That doesn't mean though that this project is not dead serious. SpaceX intends to catch the largest rocket ever built out of mid-air with these chopsticks when it comes back down for a landing. All this is done to reduce weight and get rid of unnecessary parts on the rocket itself. In theory, a Starship or Super Heavy booster does not need legs for a landing if Mechazilla works as intended. On the Moon and on Mars that's a different story, but here, on our home planet, it will give SpaceX even more payload capability and a less complex rocket to work with. Just what you need if you're constructing a rocket. My friend over from SpaceX 3D Creation Eccentric has released the best and most of the time only animation out there. It shows when exactly and what exactly happened so far. On October 6th, SpaceX workers placed the carriage system, which will slide along the tower, pulled by the drawworks system on the tower, on the assembly stand. On October 10th, then, SpaceX proceeded in placing the first chopstick into position. The second chopstick was placed in position on October 12th. Both chopsticks are held together on a single joint in the middle. So they are on the same vertical axis of rotation, able to open and close almost like a hand. In the center of the joint is a massive roller bearing to ensure friction-free and quick movement. In theory, even slightly up and down. As always, Over went into great detail, showing how the roller bearing works. Of course, SpaceX is mainly using parts that already existed before. But what they are supposed to do now and how they are assembled is completely new. No one has ever tried to catch such a large rocket and no one has ever tried it with a launch tower. It's hard to grasp the size from these pictures. These chopsticks are 35 meters or 105 feet long. A mid-sized US school bus, for example, is around 10 meters long. So one chopstick is more than three times the length of one of these. They also have a special system attached to them, moving bars. They can extend upwards. The use is still speculative, but they could either be used to align the caught rockets and they could be shock absorbers for when the ships and boosters make contact with the catch mechanism. They will likely also be used for precision stacking as there is one more mechanism in place supporting this theory. Two linear drives with ball screws on each of the chopsticks. In combination with the movable bars, they will give SpaceX the ability to precisely place boosters on the launch mount and starships on top of the boosters. This is key for the extremely fast launch cadence planned by SpaceX. Stacking operations need to be done within hours at most and repeated multiple times per day if three launches per day and per pad are to be made reality in the future. 
And finally, to move the whole assembly up and down for stacking, the assembly will be connected via a hook block to the top of the tower. Massive steel cables will be connected to the whole mechanism. The carriage system will slide along rails already installed on the integration tower with these rollers. Mauricio from RGV Aerial Photography was able to take a stunning picture of those carts that will roll up and down along the tower's sides. Four guide rolls on each corner and many in the middle to reduce friction as much as possible. This will enable SpaceX to lift boosters and ships up and down, move them left and right with the chopsticks and accomplish all of it without a crane. To lift the whole assembly up, SpaceX will use an oil rig drawworks system already attached to the tower all the way at the base and on the opposite side. It basically is a very large winch combined with a strong disc brake system. It's a technology taken from oil rigs, where they are used to lift and lower the drill stack. And it's no coincidence that oil rig tech is used. SpaceX is planning to launch Starships from their sea launch platforms in the future. Those essentially are modified oil rigs, which will make integration of the same system used at Starbase much easier on the offshore launch platforms. Massive thanks go out to Ove again for closely working together with Y and making some absolutely unique animations for all of us. Thank you Ove, you rock! So now that you're up to speed on how exactly Mechazilla will work and at what stage of assembly it currently is, let's take a look at SpaceX's next batch of prototypes, Ship 21 and Booster 5. On Mauricio's latest flyby from October 6th, it could already be seen. SpaceX's progress at Starbase is lightning fast. Four grid fins in position for installation, yet another booster ready for final assembly. SpaceX is not settling on Booster 4 and Ship 20. They are manufacturing a whole batch of orbital test candidates, and Booster 5 and Ship 21 are next in line and nearing completion already. By now, Booster 5 has received all four grid fins inside the high bay and is waiting for the final stack. As said on the last episode, it has a few differences in manufacturing compared to Booster 4. Pre-installed raceways and possibly a header tank inside the booster's main oxygen tank for boost back, re-entry and landing burns. Having received the fins, Booster 5's hull is now only two stacks away from completion. The top section reaching down to the common dome needs to be stacked on the midsection reaching down to the engine section and the midsection needs to be stacked onto the engine section. That's it! Another week maybe? Ship 21 has seen equally fast progress. Star bricks everywhere. These are the nose cone and the fairing section directly under it for Ship 21. It looks a bit like Swiss cheese, but the heat tiles now known to be called star bricks are almost done and they do look more uniform than what was seen on Ship 20. Is Ship 20 ever going to reach orbit or will number 21 be the first to try and reach the milestone of circling our planet and re-entering again? As always, tell me in the comments. Next up, we'll talk Starship 20 static fire, NASA wanting to observe a Starship re-entry, Tychonauts being busy on a heavenly palace, and the future of space stations in general, because the ISS is not getting younger. So stay tuned, it's worth it. The Y family needs your support. Give the video a like, subscribe and share it with your friends on Twitter or Facebook to show the YouTube algorithm that you appreciate the content. Looking for a more direct way of support? Become a Patreon or YouTube member by clicking the join button right under the video and get some awesome perks. Gain access to our Discord server where you can meet me and the rest of the community or get a completely ad-free release of each and every episode provided just for channel members. Or do you know about the Y Warehouse? Shop for your next Starship shirt, hoodie or cap and look as awesome as you feel. Links can be found in the description, you rock! Progress was made on Ship 20 in preparation for what we've all been waiting for for a while now. Raptor Raw in Boca Chica. All seems quiet on RGV Aerial Photography's last picture taken of Ship 20 on suborbital pad B. Too quiet. We've been waiting for a static fire for some time now. Starship Gazer was able to take some uplifting pictures though, if you get what I mean. SpaceX workers have recently installed a vacuum raptor on the prototype again, no doubt in preparation for the static fire. This returns orbit capability back to Ship 20 once more and it signals that all the talk about this prototype never doing anything clearly is wrong. The heat shield is ready. Engines are being installed. SpaceX is more ready than ever before to light this candle for the first time. 
Right now, one normal Raptor and one vacuum Raptor are installed, so we're still missing four engines for a full complement, but that can change quickly. And then it happened. This footage is brand new. If you're watching this episode early, it's less than 24 hours since it happened. Ship 20's first static fire and it looks like it was just one engine. It's hard to tell, but it looks like it was the freshly installed Vacuum Raptor. Very short duration, almost no burn at all, but it looked clean. No audible sound. Maybe it was a pre-burner test for the single RVAC. Lewis was very excited and rightfully so. Oh, sh oh, sh oh. There are no pictures of it yet, but he said that some TPS tiles, aka star bricks, fell off after the test. I'll post pictures on Twitter as soon as I have them. Tonight there's another test window and tomorrow too, so we might see more static fires very soon. The excitement is building up, Ship 20 is alive and kicking. We have new test dates coming in on a daily basis right now as well. More and more road closures are announced. Ranging from yesterday, October 18th, to tomorrow, October 20th, as of recording this episode. All in the evening and all perfect for static fires. Last week, SpaceX wanted to do the static fire, but nothing happened. An overpressure notice was already given out to local residents, but then something must not have been completely the way SpaceX wanted it to be. This week it happened, but we'll need more static fires from Ship 20 and it's half of what we need for the orbital flight. Booster 4 will have to do a static fire as well. Regarding the readiness of the Starship program and SpaceX's internal plans and schedules, NASA has recently announced an exciting project. They want to study a Starship re-entry in March of 2022. Let me introduce you to the NASA WB-57 High Altitude Atmospheric Research Plane. One of several of these planes in service at NASA has been used many times for SpaceX missions in the past. More precisely, for recovery operations of Dragon capsules. It is capable of recording the re-entry and descent of a capsule from a unique vantage point, from up to 18,000 meters above sea level. Now NASA has announced that it will utilize such a plane for an extraordinary mission, to study a Starship heat shield while it's re-entering Earth's atmosphere. And maybe even more exciting, they are stating a time frame for when this extraordinary observation will take place, March 2022. This is definite proof, once again, that we're very close to the orbital test phase. NASA creates a unique imaging system to view the re-entry with an infrared camera mounted on the WB-57. It will give them the ability to study temperature differences in great detail and in a way it's never been done before. NASA's hope is to help SpaceX reach its goal of creating an enormous heat shield that only needs minimal refurbishment after each launch. This is key to the success of the whole Starship program, which right now aims for a launch cost reduction at the order of 1 to 2 magnitudes compared to today's Falcon 9 launches. And all this might be key to my last topic for today. China is getting its next space station called Tiangong or Heavenly Palace operational right now and the ISS still does not have a successor planned. October 15th, Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center in the Gobi Desert. A Long March 2F rocket with Taikonauts Jai Shigang, Wang Yaping and Yi Guang Fu at the top. And liftoff of Shenzhou 13 towards the Chinese space station. Flawless execution, perfect flight, by now they've already docked with the station's core module called Tianhe. Five of 11 flights needed to build the station which will be about 20% the size of the ISS in the books. 7 to go. A new record for the Chinese space program. 6 month mission duration, shattering Shenzhou 12's record of 3 months, which launched in July. China is ramping up its foothold in space with a very ambitious human spaceflight program, rivaling the achievements of the so-called Western world more and more. The plan is to open up the station to other countries as soon as it's operational and to cooperate more and more in the future. And if there is no change of plans on our side, this cooperation might be very much needed too. The ISS is turning 21 on November 2nd. Happy birthday! 21 years of successful space exploration in low Earth orbit. 
21 years of an incredible story unrivaled by any other space project to date. A collaboration among the United States, Russia, Canada, Japan and the participating nations of the European Space Agency. And it still has some life left in it. It's officially approved to operate through December 2024 and an extension to the end of 2028 seems likely. But what then? How is the story going to continue? Maybe the likeliest candidate right now to take over the baton from the ISS might be Axiom Space. Their plan is to start sending their first module, called Hub 1, towards the ISS at the end of 2023. Then a second hub, a lab and a power tower for life support, storage and payload capability. And it's not such a fictional idea either. They are building it right now together with partners like NASA and SpaceX and with considerable funding. Once finished, the idea is to undock the station from the ISS, creating the first commercial space station in human history. Before that, the station will almost double the pressurized volume of the ISS for some time. With Bigelow Aerospace and its famous inflatable space modules laying off their entire workforce in March of this year and Orion Space, a California-based space station startup not securing funding, time is running out for a new project to take over after the ISS. It's hard to tell what's next after the ISS, but a private approach certainly doesn't sound bad at all after SpaceX's success story. The future of spaceflight might be much more private than currently anticipated, and it's a future promising a bright new life in space. The next few years are shaping out to be the most exciting times we've ever seen when it comes to human spaceflight. It's never too late to start learning something new, and Brilliant is a great place to start. Brilliant is an interactive STEM learning platform that helps you understand concepts by visualizing them and interacting with them. Earlier this year, Brilliant upped the interactivity on their platform to a new level and they continue adding more to their courses. Check out this lesson on the center of mass, for example. You're trying to balance mobiles to find the center of mass. You can shift around the balance points and immediately see how the mobile balances or doesn't. This is part of Brilliant's newly updated scientific thinking course, which is full of interactive exercises that let you experience the principles of science firsthand and step by step. I use Brilliant for my own learning. On Brilliant, it's not about memorizing or regurgitating facts for a test. You can just pick a course you're interested in and get started. Feeling stuck or made a mistake, you can read the explanations to find out more and learn at your own pace. If you'd like to try out Brilliant for free and get 20% off a year of STEM learning, click the link in the description down below or visit brilliant.org slash whataboutit. Learn STEM and help why. Sounds like a plan. Today's supporter shoutout goes to Ron Gum, Dwan Thompson, DOD, Johnny North and many others. You rock so incredibly much. Without you and countless others, we wouldn't even produce this content, so the entire team's gratitude is yours. Make sure to hop on our supporter exclusive Discord to join more than a thousand spaceflight enthusiasts and to give me a chance to thank you in person. Today's team shoutout goes to Luis Rodriguez for finishing his first months with us and for doing an absolutely stunning job. I hope you enjoyed your vacation week and we're all looking forward to seeing more of your work in the future. You're our eyes and ears at Starbase. You rock! And the highlight for Starship and Starbase in the last week definitely was the dr the and the the, 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 the makes contacts with the mechanism and the rollers are on the sides and you pull the pin. Mm -hmm. huh. Yes, on our little planet. The chicken sop stick. <sighs> All right, it's complex rotted, rot, rotted. The Mallorcan sun has burned my brain. It is all rotten and up and down. Great, I like it.